So we're going to the very last. Uh, there are um, two speakers now. Alina will speak first. I will follow after her as a slightly shorter than other people's presentations. And then we're going to do what's called a goldfish, goldfish bowl. And I shall explain that when we get to it. Um, and I shall hand over to Alina now. So I've been torn um, about going back to the basics or, or talking about lots of things that have come up. And I am actually going to take a step back and, and talk about something which is really important to my relationship with painting and I think to every figurative artist's relationship with painting. I think that most or all figuration, including the work that's here, um, lies on a spectrum which is from pure materiality to complex storytelling. And we've talked a little bit about this idea of how we relate to work and the materiality on mobile phones. Um, and usually when we see images on mobiles, the materiality disappears, it's reduced to the subject matter. Um, and yet this fascination for materials is, keeps coming up. Um, because this session is more about the, the materi materiality, our embodiment and our relationship with why we choose that media to work in, both in painting and in drawing. Um, I do want to go back to this kind of basic tension between the narrative and the materiality, which it, for me is at the crux of figuration. Um, now, true theory of painting in art theory has first off started with a very kind of art historical approach very much looking at what had happened and looking at the hermeneutics, so the interpretation of works of art. Um, and then theory of painting, as kind of pure theory of painting, has a long tradition with a relationship with mimesis, so this idea of copying the world. Um, but I think that what really happens and becomes exciting is when we start talking about this materiality. So um, I've called it here story and texture. Um, it can be story and texture. As I said before, it could be narrative and materiality. Sometimes it's been referred to as subject and surface. And in its more um, theoretical uh, kind of words, it's just form and content, content and form. Um, and there's a really useful philosophical model to actually approach this. And I want to use a, a quote from Maurice Denis, a painter, who says, remember that a picture before being a battle horse a female nude or some, th some sort of anecdote is essentially a flat surface covered with colors assembled in a certain order. Now, the, the theorist who is really helpful to this kind of crux of figuration for me is Richard Walheim, who talked about twofoldness. Now, twofoldness is this idea that when we're looking at work, we have a dual response. It's the response to the mark making, the actual physicality of the work, um, a sort of abstract response, and then also the response to the subject matter. Um, it's a really convincing and helpful thesis. And in his own words, he says, I use twofoldness to pick out the distinctive experience that is required to fix the content of representational pictures. In consequence, this enables me to use twofoldness to explain what pictorial representation is. So it places twofoldness at the very heart of what pictorial representation is. It's not just another theory. It's, it, it is the basis, the crux. Um, and what's important in it is the idea that there's a simultaneous awareness. According to Danto, they are two aspects of a single experience. They are not two experiences. So it's maybe useful to kind of have a think about what happens at the two extremes of these um, distinctions. On the side of form, maybe you can see that we have kind of pure abstraction. And on the side of content, we just have the illustration of a subject matter. But what happens when there's a rupture between form and content is really quite exciting. Now, smooth paint and the handling of paint is actually a way of managing form and content. So it's not just, we're not talking about slapping on impasto and thick troweling on of paint. It's the relationship between how we choose to use the medium. 
Um, but the duality does become more evident when form takes on extreme materiality. And I think the landmark in this, in art history, is really Titian, who starts to pull painting open and the mark making open. Um, Vasari's famous description calls Titian's work pittura de magia. So he's like painting in stains and splodges. Um, obviously, at the time, that wasn't necessarily a positive a compliment to his work. Um, but when the materiality becomes more prominent, that potential friction is open up between form and content, the narrative and the materiality. And I think it's particularly relevant to what we're talking about here, which is figuration. Again, that's a word that's maybe up for discussion. Um, but rather than seeing this painter's paradox as a problem, it can be understood as the very starting point from which all painters' decisions or draft people's decisions are made from. There's a really beautiful example, um, a visual example in the Prado, where you've got two Titians side by side. You've got Sisyphus on one side, where you can see that there's a really distinct treatment of the rendering of the form, which is more closed. And there's this beginning of the idea of the pittura di magia, the more gestural and, and material treatment of the paint in the background. And the painting on the right, Titius, is painted 15 years later when suddenly there's a breakdown and this treatment and the materiality of the surface kind of opens up. Now, this coexistence of form and content quite often happens quite organically. There are technical treaties and manuals about handling and rendering different subject matter. But I think it's really interesting to, at the very least, be aware of those decisions we're making when we're dealing with certain subject matter. And that would be maybe a weak hypothesis, just be aware of what's going on with form and content and how they work together. And a stronger hypothesis is to say that maybe we could be intentionally making them converge. Now I'm going to go back to the quote that was up at the very beginning, which is from Max Beckman. It's not the subject which matters, but the translation of the subject into the abstraction of the surface by means of painting. It's such a great quote. <laughs> um, and I think the choices that represent form and content converging can actually be traced back to very simple things like the traditional nomenclature of things like uh, landscape format and portrait format. So rather than talking about horizontal and vertical, we're already associating a subject matter with the way that we must actually deal with that subject matter. But any choice of format, of palette, of compositional device is actually a formal decision. And usually those formal decisions go hand in hand with what the painting is actually representing the subject matter. As a painter, Vincent Desiderio, who is a wonderful painter, but also a fascinating theorist, um, and he's put forward a, a theory, really, really interesting, which touches upon this idea of form and content converging. In his case, it's not necessarily the convergence of form and content, but how form can embody ideas. To quote him, he says, from the start, I recognize that the real idea of the picture resides in the way materials are coaxed into meaning. And he makes a distinction between technical narrative, which is this coaxing into meaning through materials, and dramatic narrative, which is just the subject matter. He says the technical narrative should be the preeminent voice of the picture. Now, theory with visual languages always has its limits, and it's something we're going to talk about soon. Sorry? <laughs> no, I thought that you couldn't hear me, that's fine. Um, but I want to bring it down and actually make it concrete. I want to give a few examples. So, of this idea of convergence and form and content. Now, the first two are from art history, so it's always a perspective that maybe is interpretative. Maybe it's being thrown onto the work, but I'm gonna look at some others in the words of the artist, contemporary artists, 
that kind of sidesteps that problematic. But first, let's look at Luis de Morales. He was called the divine. Um, and he wasn't just called divine because he just represented religious subject matter. It was also because he was thought to re represent the most moving and subtle depictions of religious imagery. Now, if you actually look at, um, I know this goes back to the idea of can we actually see painting in, in reproduction, but there's a delicacy of kind of sumato technique and this kind of layering that creates a more almost ethereal presence that augments the subject matter. Going back to Titian, um, Jody Cranston has put forward this theory, which is that um, his paint becomes corporeal. So he's actually embodying the figures, not just representing them. And this goes back to the idea of convergence. And she says, the physicality of the medium also complicates the representational, sorry, the long-standing assumption in representational painting that the subject matter dictates and predominates over the means of representation. And here's the important bit, rather than that, they affect and change one another. So jumping to the more contemporary landscape, we can look at Cecily Brown's work. And she actually cherishes that ambiguous moment which was linked to Wilhelm's theory of twofoldness. She calls it the moment of breaking down or the biomorphic moment. And like Titian, um, she talks about, and in her own world, words, the oil paint lends itself to, very well to describing flesh, or not describing so much as making an equivalent to flesh. Next example is Barbara Walker. Um, and her work is very much about presence and absence and erasure. And she says that erasure is a metaphor and analogy for a new number of things. I'm looking at how these individuals have been erased from history. Michael Armitage um, is a painter who's actually in a show coming up soon called um, Radical Figures at the Whitechapel Gallery, which shows that actually figuration is coming back in the focus and the spotlight. Um, and I think his work is really very exciting and he talks about the choice of the support that he works on and he says, I think there's something of the character of the Lubago bark cloth and its resistance to being painted on that parallels the frictions in cultural changes within Kenya and of Kenyan culture within a global community. Now, this is just a quick talk, so I just want to go back to this idea that these discussions don't necessarily need to be overtly theoretical um, and deconstructive. Sometimes the convergence occurs quite organically after years of engagement and decision-making and thinking through the paint, which is something that comes up a lot. Um, Desiderio again says, the terse relationship between thought and action and the making of things is at its best when it's not self-conscious. It goes back to that idea of fast thinking, slow thinking, what happens when we're aware of things or not. Um, and people like Titian and Rembrandt and Goya, going back, are actually an example of what happens in the late years through a, year, a, a life's worth of making choices through paint. And just to conclude, the idea of form and content converging, um, there's this beautiful quote which I've used a lot in the relationship to a lot of the paintings that we're actually sitting amongst. This idea of how paint can come to embody an idea. Now that idea could be narrative, it could be more evocative. Um, and there's a beautiful quote by Daniel Maidman who was interviewing Vincent de Sillerio and he says, one senses the presence of ideas in them, in the work, as one senses an enormous animal moving in a dense forest. It appears only in glimpses, but its passage disturbs trees and air. Um, and I just want to throw out that idea that form and content, the materiality of the work, and how we're actually deciding to paint and use this stuff of mud, like you were making reference to, Connor, 
um, going back to this very visceral materiality is actually at the heart of the decision to choose to paint. Um, and just throw out that awareness of the balance between the storytelling and the materiality. And I think that that's all. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking about embodiment, and um, in a way it's, it's similar to what Alina has been talking about. She's talking about the materiality of the paint. I'm going to be talking about the material, materiality of our own corporal bodies, our bodies and our experience in, in our bodies. And what this might mean for a figurative artist, and, but it, it could apply to different cultural activities. We're told we are in a new age, and we thought we were heading to the age of Aquarius, but we find ourselves in the Anthropocene, and our kind might be referred to as Homo plasticus. And there is a new art form I've been reading about, it's Vogue, called rather disturbingly, oh, 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 or object, oriented ontology and its artworks where the human being is not present at all. It might be um, some ants, ants in, a, in a glass case that continues on when the gallery is closed. And we might prefer to wipe out man because we're a little concerned about our impact on our beautiful planet. But in reality, we somehow have to find a way of integrating ourselves with the natural world of our planet. Disassociated man, the tribe who travel with their special screens on the underground, disassociated is not only disassociated from himself or herself, is disassociated from the planet and all life on the planet. So I think perhaps the school of O, 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 of object-orientated ontology, perhaps isn't such a great art school or theory. I think we have to face that we are here, we are real, we're embodied, and we have a massive impact on our Earth. Perhaps we could look at what it is to be not embodied. Uh, some people call it being in your head disconnected from the here and the now, from a state of being. It's the condition where perhaps we're ruminating and agonizing over the past, or we're worrying and obsessing about the future. It prevents us from being present. I remember being part of, there was a very uh, formal site-sized drawing class I went to. And uh, those of you that know sight size might not, uh, will know, but they, you measure very carefully and you pace backwards and forwards, constantly measuring. And the whole class was doing this, all very, very, very carefully, looking for excellence and accuracy and using our visual abilities to, uh, to draw. And there was actually a, we entered into a deep state of group observation as a group. And there was almost a pulse and a rhythm as we quietly paced back forwards and forwards, deeply observing the model who was sitting very quietly and patiently and bravely in some places. And at the end, we had a multi-perspectival group of drawings. Each human being had gazed deeply, desperately trying to observe as best they can and observe the light and observe the forms. And almost as a group, we formed in all our artworks, a special group artwork, although it wasn't collaborative in any way or intended to be. However, it was collaborative. And with the same group, we had some portrait work we were doing in the afternoon. And we had a model come in who was putting earphones in. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and as she sat and the earphones went in, her she sort of slumped 
and a dead look came over her. She disassociated from the experience of being in the room. And in the end, we had to ask her to please not put the earphones in because the magic was lost because she was disassociating. It was quite interesting with the things Marinella was saying earlier about being a model and, and how present or not present. But certainly this experience of having these, these earphones was just taking her out of that state. And we had another time, actually, my daughter Jessica over there was, was modeling. And the, um, the tutor put her in a quite a difficult pose, it was just a portrait pose, but she was really twisted. And she was starting to suffer from the pose. She was suffering physically. And the tutor, who's a very good artist, was tearing his hair out because he couldn't get her right. And I thought, you can't get her right because she is in pain. And you're not, you're not able to pick out what is core to Jessica because you've actually got somebody in pain in front of you, which he was not, he really was looking just at her for surface and her as a, he wasn't engaging with the fullness of her being and her discomfort. So in this room, everyone here comes, we all come with a container of our own beliefs and perspective and experience. When we're present, we're engaged in our body, and we're not thinking about the fast past and the f worrying about the future, we can become aware of what our fellow beings have in their containers. We can listen, we can share, and we might even find something new which neither of us have come with. But in our interaction, the space between us, we discover collaborative meaning making and I think I've definitely I think I definitely that's not a very good term is it I've seen it happening here today where new stuff is coming out that perhaps we hadn't thought out we've either got it from someone else or we've created some new kind of thinking and there's good reason I'm showing those slides not to diss anyone who's not shown slides but I started to think um, when I spoke I wanted to be engaged with you rather than looking at pictures that are not here in the room. Because we're here in the room with these pictures and our discussions, the artists in the room, the thinkers in the room, the pictures in the room are all creating a sort of perfect storm, to use perhaps not the best phrase, of an aesthetic experience here, now, that will never be repeated again. We're all here, we're interacting with each other and these works and everything that's come together to this special experience together. We're co-creating something. I don't I've heard a lot about the death of the author, and it's interesting that the death of the author came at the time when women and people of color were just coming into their own. And the critic reappropriated the power at that point. And I don't think we can say that other people don't have a right to have some authorship when they look at a work. So I try to think of, there's not the death of the author or the death of the artist, but we're having an embodied shared experience when we look at a work of art. We look at the work, everything the artist has brought to you and all their experiences has, speaks for them and they're able to speak as well. And then we also bring everything that we have and we collaborate with an artist with their piece of work and the works even start to collaborate with each other and create new meanings and things we can start to... When we hung the show, we were looking at works. We agonized over it, but in the end, we felt every work was exactly where it needed to be and had a relationship with the other pieces. So this is a completely unique experience. It will never happen again like this again. I had a friend of mine, a New York artist, and he... <laughs> We were on a residence. He said, oh, he hadn't managed to produce much work. And he said, oh, maybe he said, I don't need to make art. Maybe he could just act like an artist. And I, I laughed at him. I said, oh, you dummy. <laughs> you have to make art. But I did, it did get me thinking. 
How does an artist act? Artists act by making art. It's strange that we talk about conceptual artists as if it was some new idea. All art is conceptual. But after the concept comes the making, which Alina was talking about. And the making can't be comprehended by those who do not make. The embodied present experience of making a piece of art is something can only be experienced. It, we could talk about it till the cows come home, but there's something about being in front of a piece of work and there's a relationship with reality and your materials and your body and your eyes and the, the world around you. So I just want to be a bit more embodied. So I'm here in this room with you. I'm not talking about, I'm not showing you any slides. We're here with the works. And I want to try and just have a response that's right now. And I was thinking about Jane, actually, and Jane's work. And when we first met, and we were on the Norfolk coast, I'd never met her before. And there was this woman, her hair was everywhere. The wind was blowing, it was chilly. And she was painting this amazing painting of these uh, uh, fishermen who were on the boats, but they just brought the catch in, and she was, she was painting them. And, she, and I, knowing what I know about painting out of doors, and I knew the experience she was having, and it's the totality of being planted in place, your feet are on the earth, the air is blowing through your hair, it's cold, you're struggling with your materials, but you've got this vision. And she has an amazing relationship with the ordinary um, men that work the land and, and work, work on the sea on the Norfolk coast. So very, Jane has an amazing embodied practice in her artwork. And I'm looking at Alina here because I'm going to say something I'm ashamed of. Because Alina and I, we've worked together, we talk about theory so much, our, 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 um, so many times we think the same thing. Yet, I have not engaged with Alina's piece of work and talked to her about her process and her work. So here I am embodied, realizing I've missed something terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Paul, I went to his studio and he has amazing drawings. I wanted to have them here as well, but we couldn't fit everything in. We had the painting, but it was great talking to him and I'm just being in his studio and having a cup of tea together and having his wife there with her, her drawings here too. Just engaging at that moment in the studio, the same when I went to see Connor, just to, he told me about using spinel black and here we are at his palette, and he's like, mm, look at this spinel black, and it does this differently. And I, okay, oh my God, yes, spinel black. Just, I'm not thinking about theory or anything, I'm just like, wow, I just want some spinel black to try at home. So about being em embodied, we're there, the material's there, we're together, we're in the now. So I'm going to explain how a goldfish bowl works. The idea is that we create, I think my brother laughed at me, um, King Arthur's round table. We create a round movement of people. So we're concentric circles all around a central five chairs. We'll put five chairs in the center. And if we can move everyone that goes all around the, f the goldfish bowl, and we're going to have a communal discussion. We'll start off with Alina, myself, and, um, oh gosh, I'm running out of names. We've got, oh, Emma Brassington's going to join us because we had someone fall out. Thank you, Emma, for stepping in there. And John Devane. Well, I think this, this last um, session was, came out of the idea of the interest with the materiality, the mark making and the painting, and also the idea of the embodiment and the ritualization um, that can take place when you make work, and also that you can represent within work. So I think lots of different things are gonna come out of this session because maybe there's not, s there are lots of different directions it can take. Um, I know that John, um, 
you've talked a lot and work a lot with the idea of kind of materiality and the mark making. I was wondering if you could throw in any thoughts there. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, um, I'm probably going to lower the bar a bit now, but I mean, what, for me, one of the, um, the key aspects to any artist's armory, I think now, is the use of chance serendipitous sort of connections. So that I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of how, how paint is used to make an image in, in much the way that Alina was talking. But I think that one of the things that's happened for me in making art over the years is that sometimes those chance elements that might occur, um, for instance, uh, David Sylvester's interviews with Francis Bacon for me is, is, is still an amazing text about painting because it talks about this sense of chance, this sense of the unexpected, and I think, I mean, what I do, I, I do paintings of figures and figurative structures, if you like, but they're often born out of a degree of chance elements. They're not literally collages, but they might be just things chanced upon. I mean, I know other artists have said similar things. So to me, it's about, it's a, it's a physical thing about breaking the logic and breaking the predictability of what might otherwise be a more straightforward sort of figurative situation, but it also is an, um, an empowering thing, I think. So that's what I'd like to put in at this moment in time. But it's connected to the materiality, the physical making um, of, of, of images, I think. I think that connects to that idea that, that some of the thought process, it's not about theory all the time. We're not talking about, oh, when I'm standing in front of making work or even making films, um, that I'm going through all the theory in my mind. The theory might be there as an underpinning, but then everything happens quite spontaneously. And I, I think it's Albach who talks about kind of even... Um, accidents, the choice to keep an accident or not, is a form of decision making. And I, th I really like this idea of decision making, constant decision making. Um. I was just thinking, yes, yeah, about this decision making. It is an interesting thing, that the art of the accident, because I'm, I don't like art that's, t I don't like too much accident. There's this sort of difficult path to take between having a concept at the beginning of a piece of work and certain ideas and then as you travel the journey of facing the reality of your work as opposed to what you thought it was going to be in the beginning that can actually be quite a difficult journey and whether I actually try and fight it in and um, and 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 leave that behind but I'm going to I have to exit my seat in just a moment but just before I go and say to Emma perhaps she could talk about the accident of filmmaking, I don't know if, or did you really control it? So, talking about embodiment in work and with painting, I guess, the embodiment is, and choice and decision making is control. And when you're embodied, often people think, oh, therefore you're in control, but it's actually like being able to take things come as they go and then bringing in the accident or not. And then related to the filmmaking, I guess it was quite an embodied thing for me because I was outside of my comfort zone. So the real uh, physical effects that having a camera in my hand was having on me, you know, it did, it changed the way I was interacting with people. I was slightly nervous. I was probably like shying away at points. So as an embodied artist at that moment, I was very aware of my physical state. Um, and then, yeah, you can't, I wasn't controlling what was being visible. I could decide shots or I ha had help setting up some of the shots, but a lot of it was definitely by chance. And then being able to observe other people as they were moving around in the space um, and when I was doing some of the research that goes into that, it all came out of masks. Like I do a lot of, I make a lot of masks and I'm really interested in the embodiment of when you wear a physical thing on your face, how it changes your body on a very physical level. And I was doing some research into wearing a mask of the everyday and I was looking at research of uh, poker players and how they subdue their emotions and, but you have micro expressions that are constantly informing people around you on what, how you're feeling, a bit like what you were saying earlier about, you know, if a model's in the space, you, if you're embodied, you can feel that model's presence. So it's interesting on the tube as well as when you're 
we're constantly subduing our micro expressions uh, and it actually has like negative psychological effects which increase isolation and there's a lot of correlation between different working professions where you have to hold a certain face and how that affects you and I think it's quite interesting and important to raise awareness of that. Hi. Um, many years ago, I used to visit Dungeness, and at the time, a certain filmmaker called Eric Jarman was setting up the scene for his film, The Garden. And I was down there drawing in the landscape and the flatness. And I met him in a pub called the Britannia. And he says, you're an artist? I said, yeah. I'm working on a film. Can you work a camera, a Bolex camera? I said, no, I have no idea. Well, I've got a spare one. Use it, see what happens. And that was a pure chance. And I was terrified. <laughs> and I just had to go. And it was pure chance that I got the exposure right and the timing right. And I was just filming on an ad hoc basis. No script, no direction, and I was just observing what was happening, including a, paper, uh, a plastic bag which was blowing in the wind, which he really liked, but it was edited out of the film. And it was those little subtle bits and pieces that uh, made me think about really looking and playing with chance. And recently, I, I was painting a picture, a quite big one, of a figure in front of a, a, a sunflower. And I was having terrible trouble trying to get all the seeds right, all those concentric mathematical patterns. And in the end, I thought, I've got to black it all out because it, 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 it's, it's doing my head in. And I realized I was being too formalistic, too, too, too rigid. So I blacked it out, and then I thought about the title of the painting. And the, point, the title was, When You Look Into the Abyss, The Abyss Looks Back at You. So by blacking out the, the seeds, the actual head of the, of the sunflower with a figure in front of it, I made the center of the sunflower the abyss. And it somehow made the picture. It made the sunflower more menacing, which I hadn't thought about before. And really, if you see the painting, if you come to a show next week, you'll see it. Um, and it's about the whole thing pops up the idea of fear, the fear of looking ahead about the human condition. So chance has many positive things to the outcome. I guess, yeah, looking at chance and all these different different things that can play into a situation and when you were talking about masks that kind of brought up like so with with my my poem um I, I start off looking at like kind of how mirrors can be mazes and like there's actually so many uh, intricate and sometimes hidden um things beneath uh, that we don't always see on the surface um and Sometimes, as the, the the chance that kind of comes into all the all these decisions that we make, like kind of we don't always we think it might be a a, a conscious decision on on the surface, but actually there's uh, all these things that play into it. I wanted to, I guess, just bring in how when we were kind of really made aware of those things and like kind of and the, the situation that we're in, it can then actually really alter the direction of it. So I, I really like the, the meta move you made of actually just like kind of making us very aware of the water that we're swimming in. Like kind of we have these theories, but like where do they actually come from? But also how, how do they then impact the, the space that we're in and the people that we're with? And like kind of that really embodied uh, understanding of these aren't just just abstract theories that you know, the art that we're creating even if it's like coming from wherever it's coming from it then has an impact on the people around us and then those people around us have an impact on us and it's just like constant like kind of feedback process um yeah and just it 
there's kind of a, a chaos, chaos like kind of there. I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think for me, one of the things is that the um, I think logic is a really is a real enemy of art in in many ways. And I think if things are too too sorted out and too clear, then you know the chance elements just don't work. Um, I just went last week to see the um, Anselm Kiefer at Bermondsey, um, white, white Cube, and I, I thought in a way that it struck me that the thing about art and paintings in particular that are perplexing and perhaps interesting is that you don't get a clear sense of what they're really about. You think you know what they're about, and they're about all sorts of layers of things, but I think they are, um, when they are really at their best, and I think what Alina's talking about, this thing of form and, form and content, you're looking at something like Velasquez, you can look at it over and over again, and it's still always elusive. It's never quite um, spelt out in some way. And I think that's where, for me, going back to the idea of chance, that can, that can add to that level of um, something being slightly perplexing. Um, so I think it's, it's that complexity and layering that can draw the viewer back in. And I think it's something that is rarely, it's not quite as evident in, in, the, in the digitized image. I think it can be lost there, because I think it is the two, to do with the manufacture. It's the physical handprint, it's that mud on the wall. I, I came back in because um, we were going to have a, a panelist who's one of the exhibiting artists, who's Alan Lawson. Um, and he has a very kind of, um, when I've heard him speak in other talks, he has this very embodied response to the subject that he's actually painting. Um, his painting is the small painting on the wall there. Um, and there's actually a photograph when you come in, which is the painting that exists underneath. And to go back to that idea of um, the corporeality, the physicality, and the interaction that we have with different media, which can happen, like you were saying, when you were negotiating the space in film, it's quite interesting that in paint, there is this element of the trace of that embodied experience. So painting is layered and layered and layered. Um, and although it can happen in different ways with superposition of images, for example, in film, and, and language can have lots of different layers as well, um, there is that physicality of those decision-making processes that happens in drawing and painting, which I find quite exciting. <coughs> I'd like to carry on with that idea about chance, but I wouldn't call it chance. I'd call it something like above chance. I'll try and explain what I mean. That uh, when I was at art school in the early 60s, believe it or not, we were persuaded to trace comics and print them in silkscreen prints and not to draw and not to paint. So therefore, nobody taught me anything about how to paint. <coughs> and I spent many years devouring everything from the artist and illustrator to painting in the Renaissance workshop and everything, trying how to learn how to paint properly. And then I was reading a catalogue of a Manet exhibition that I'd been to, and there was a quote from Manet. I learned two things from it. One was about swimming pools, and one was about approach to art. And he said that every time I start a painting, it's like diving into the deep end of a swimming pool and not knowing how to swim. So, and I know for me and for lots of other artists to not know what you're doing is one of the most important things. If I know what I'm doing, when I first discovered this, what I started doing was saying, oh, I can do that, so I'll start working in pastels. Oh, I can do that, so I'll work. But it is so important for me, and I'm sure for lots of artists, that the chance is more a sort of elevated learning discovery chance. Not just, not just the sort of chance of Leonardo going up the... Was it Leonardo who went to the place where all the dying people were because he wanted to draw monsters and he found where the tubercular people were spitting and he drew that? Not that sort of chance, but a learning chance. Hi, I'm going to abdicate in favor of the other camp because I think chance is a form of mystification. And I would like to tell a little story. When Edgar Allan Poe published the poem The Raven, it was actually praised as a piece of emotional, it was more unconscious, and he actually refused that interpretation and he 
went and wrote an essay where he deconstructed every single choice that he made and showed it was a very, very cerebral piece of work. And one of the translators of Poe in, into French was Baudelaire. And when you analyze the symbolist and you think it's all very unconsciously written, you realize that it's the opposite. It's absolutely perfectly constructed. So a lot of things that come across as chance are actually the result of planning of an, a whole framework of work that guides you into a decision. It's interesting how you're talking about the chance or the appearance of chance. <laughs> she can't get away. <laughs> um, it, I know that um, uh, Sargent, for example, was a well he's very well known for his brush strokes. There may be a brush stroke that looks like it's just been, you know, just cast across the painting like that, and it just beautifully describes something that's happening. But those who watched him work said, you know, explained that he actually might redo that stroke again and again, and it was only the appearance of looseness. In fact, it was, he, he had to work his way very carefully. And I think it's also like learning to drive or learning to dance at the beginning, you're struggling with learning how to do. But then once, you, once you've learned how to do, like Max was saying, there's a, it's an elevated chance. It's not, it's, not, it's not the chance of the universe, things just falling a certain way, that you've got an understanding and a knowledge about what you're doing. You know things about the materials you're using. So you're, it's a different sort of chance, an elevate. I'm just absolutely with Max there, it's an elevated sort of chance. Uh, one of the things I, I do is take time-lapse videos of myself painting. And it started out as um, the idea, I suppose, I wanted to just document and demonstrate the process from beginning to end. But one of the th things I found really curious was that uh, my experience in front of the, the canvas, you know, we, we talk about not knowing what you're doing. My experience from moment to moment uh, in painting some of these pictures was exactly that of really not knowing what I was doing. I felt like I was floundering uh, and pushing towards uh, a, an obscure end to some extent. But the curious thing I found was that when I looked at the video and the whole thing was speeded up, the, the, the whole process seemed to unfold with an astonishing sense of purpose, uh, but it wasn't a sense of purpose that I was totally conscious of at the time or on the scale that, you know, that my, that my mind was working. So I think there are some lessons there in, in the, I suppose, the, the strangeness, the deviousness of our own minds, the way we solve problems sometimes over a scale that we're not fully aware of. Uh, and that I think is, you know, I, I, I think chance can be fetishized. I think, you know, and the surface of a painting can be uh, fetishized. I think there, there are some uh, dichotomies, you know, like Alina, brought up like abstract and illustrative that I think tend to, can also fetishize the, 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 the surface. Um, and they belong to a particular period in, in the, the development of thought about painting, which I'd associate with, you know, the early 20th century. And, uh, you know, Titian didn't think about whether he was abstract or illustrative, uh, and I'm not sure that he thought about, uh, uh, to, to, put it, to put it a different way, I think he was thinking about what he could get away with. And uh, it's more like where you're playing a game and you know that there are certain rules and some that you can shade uh, and 
I think that often happens. You know, like in, 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 in music, you have similar ideas that developed at a certain point between pure music and program music, for example, which is a very, again, sort of late 19th, 30, 20th century idea. And there's been the tendency to push that back to, say, Bach, and say, oh, Bach, you know, this is a piece of pure music by Bach. Whereas I don't think he thought about that at all, you know? I think when Bach was writing a fugue, you know, a fugue, like it's literally a chase, you know? That's what it is. It's, it's voices chasing each other, and the rule is, you, you better not sing in octaves, you know? That that's the rule, you, can, you, you have to sing the same music, and you can't sing in octaves. So you have to do everything else, you know? You, you can invert it, you can, play, you can go faster, you can go slower, but all the different voices, they can't line up, or if they do, you're, you know, you're breaking the rule. And that becomes, that whole game then becomes, what can you get away with, you know? And that's where, Bach's music takes off because he tries every trick, you know, it's everything that, uh, that an active mind can do to, to, to work within the parameters. So that I think is maybe a different way of, of looking at a painting, you know, to look at it, okay, what's the game here? What's the intention and what can you get away with? Uh, and then concepts, you know, older concepts that would have been familiar from Titian like from rhetoric, essentially, like ellipsis and uh, th things like that come in, which are a little bit more natural to, to uh, a, a little bit more, more organic to the thought that actually generated the, uh, the work. Because I think abstract and illustrative is, they're, in some ways, they're both dead ends to me, and particularly in terms of how far they've been pushed uh, in, in the 20th century. Uh, I think we need to pull things back together into the middle, but also to, to get away from, you know, I, I think when, when we don't know what we're doing, we sometimes we fetishize the surface. And it becomes all about you know art for art's sake and and all of these. Whereas if you have a, 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 a you know if you have a game plan, if you have an, a, a clear end, then it becomes a little bit more uh, about being playful in terms of achieving those ends. So no, sorry, it just, it just tr triggers some ideas for me about, about perhaps using the, the analogy of, of an orchestra of music and a piece of music. And, and I'll uh, <laughs> think about it in terms of a painting. And there will be different instruments in a piece of music that perhaps, or a particular style that will hold the piece together, but there'll be all the different other parts. So, so perhaps the different types of artists and the different styles of painting, some will, will be uh, super realistic, some will be thinking a lot about the material, others are thinking about the content. All, this, all these different, a, a painting is a, woven from so many different things of, of what we do and feel as humans and then our, the craft of what we're doing as well. And, and some will lean a bit more to one or the other, or even a, one particular artist will start in a certain way and they'll start to move in a different way. So I think we, we're looking at a very complex mix uh, uh, of things. And I think if, if as you say, if we fetish fetish size, I can't even say it, one too much, we can, we can, can lose some of the instruments we can have perhaps in our, in, in our orchestral um, toolbox, as it were. I think fetishization is, is always something that can happen, um, and it's always a, a danger or maybe just an aesthetic pleasure sometimes. Um, and I, it's really interesting because I'm so interested in different aspects of painting, um, and I decided to talk about that idea of form and content precisely because I do think that it all coalesces, in, especially in figuration, in this middle ground where you're playing around with the surface, but also with the ideas that it's conveying. Um, but at the same time, I think that, for example, one of the formal elements that we deal with a lot is the way we re represent space. Um, and one of the conventions that is constant throughout the history of painting, Western painting, um, I have to add, is that 
we are working with a renaissance type space that developed with um, the idea of humanism and actually going back to that Mantegna Christ, Christ who's lying down where suddenly we're allowing ourselves to dethrone God that actually perspective is being applied to a, a religious figure. And so suddenly the human being is the center of the world. Um, and I think going back to this idea of the Anthropocene, there is, we have to negotiate as painters, as people who make drawings and work with a tradition of perspectival space that that is laden with lots of values. It's laden with a, anthropocentrism, which is quite problematic in the Anthropocene. Um, it's laden with this idea of a capitalist tradition, which is very problematic. And, um, and I think that we need to always be aware that we're questioning and constantly in dialogue with all of the traditions that we are um, working with, and not to be dictated by the traditions without being aware that there is a, bug a baggage and a cultural baggage there. Yeah, just going off of that, even so that there are even some critiques of even should we even be using the Anthropocene uh, to describe this period? Because, you know, we've gotten into this current situation we're in with climate and all, all sorts of things, actually, f largely in part due to this very separatism, like separatist way of thinking and experiencing, like, kind of ourselves like, in the world and not realizing that we're actually part of this wider ecosystem. And again, it's this sort of, yeah, it's also like very much through kind of this like dualist tradition of like kind of separation um, that we're seeing all different kinds of, yeah, like kind of crises emerging. And yeah, and that there's the, the, even the, just the potential danger of like kind of really like putting ourselves into this like Anthropocene mindset. We're like, okay, yeah, we're the ones who now have to take charge of like kind of how all these earth systems move um, and just yeah there's just some some caution that needs to be taken um, around separating ourselves from the rest of the context and again just like really embodying ourselves within the wider like, kind of world system so. I wish I'd not mentioned chance now um, <laughs> it would have been a lot easier yeah um, I think there's a lot of interesting topics that I've sort of permeating through the discussion and um, I do think that this um, one of the things that Alina's just picked up on um, is, is that use of space is the idea that space in, in paintings is ambiguous it's that thing that I think uh, Ernst Gombrich said it was about reciprocal neglect so it's a flat surface it's also an illusion and for me it's, it's it comes back to what Connor was saying a bit earlier I mean why should why should anybody want to paint in the 21st century um, and for me, I think it's because when you're doing it, you're doing, you're doing it for the first time. I mean, the, the thing that gets me about painting is it, gets, it doesn't get any easier. Um, it's still a struggle, and in a way, I think that's part of maybe, um, I'm sure the same with filmmaking. It, it, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing, perplexing challenge in a way that is maybe draws us into whatever it is we're interested in and however we shape that experience. Um. You could describe the accident. Uh, uh, you could call it an imperfection. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, quite often, you know, human beings write about or strive for utopian societies, but if you, you know, they always tend to break down because they're full of imperfections. We are full of imperfections, and in painting, I think. I don't think that necessarily means to say they're bad things. It's, it, it's not something that you shouldn't strive for. It would be lovely if the world didn't have any conflict in it. But it, it might also take away some of the richness that we have in the world because good things come out of conflict as well in terms of the humanity that you show, that people show towards um, refugees and things like that. You, 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 you see the dark side, but there is also... You always, it allows you to see the good side of humanity as well. So maybe th there is a reason for conflict. In, and I think conflict exists within painting. So when you get those imperfections, I think you should sort of nourish them and enjoy them 
and, and learn to, to recognize them because it, it, you, you may not use them and you may um, choose to obliterate them, but, but sometimes if you adopt them, they can be really interesting. Um, I've looked at super realist paintings and marveled at techniques actually ultimately sometimes I come away feeling okay <laughs> could have taken a photograph I think something that we're I don't want to say losing and be so generalizing as that but losing touch with the materials that we're using like being able to marvel at the imperfections of a paint is through a lot of paint that we're buying if we're not creating it ourselves or find the pigment ourselves is that we're actually losing a lot of as painters perhaps an embodied practice and but you know there are ways around that you can make your own pigments it's you can incorporate gesture I was just wondering if you have um, any ways that you would say that you would you're embodied as a painter like but through your materials and I guess the surface Yeah, I, mean, it's a good, I think it's a good question. I, th I think that, um, I think to answer that, I think it comes about through a sort of immersion in, 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 the, in the thing, the stuff that, that is paint. And I think that um, I would hope that that, that you know, um, allows for a sort of embodied experience, really. I'm not, it's not always a technical thing. I, th I think it is to do with um, state of mind, um, um, your relationship with this thing that, it, that is forever shifting and the sort of flux of, of that surface and how it works. I mean, I find the whole thing deeply frustrating, really. Um, it, and as I say, it just doesn't get any easier. And, and I, and I, I kind of wonder why at times. But it, it's, it's, it's to do with that, I guess, when you're not embodied, as it were, then maybe there is a sort of a disconnect and that's not entirely helpful, I guess. I'm just going to... Um kind of go back one step, which is this idea of um, deciding whether you want to paint or not, or what medium you're going to use. Um, and going back to the idea of this, the, the realities of the Anthropocene and, and even linking to Connor's talk, the nosedive that's kind of happening, this dark um, potential age of lots of conflict, crisis, movement. Um, and I can't help, it's something that I'm developing, kind of maybe some drawings or series of paintings about this, that I can't help but imagine with mass migration of people that paintings will be used as tents. And actually, there'll be loads of beautiful paintings that are just constructing these tents um, when people are actually breaking down urban environments and recreating new environments and negotiating spaces. Just wanted to throw that out there. Oh, what a lovely idea. <laughs> I want several tents. <laughs> but I, I came in because of um, the idea of what we use to paint with. So, you know, Richard Long, he, he started doing big mud things on the wall, but how do you make it stick? I practiced with actually putting mud on my pictures, but it dries, so it's not the right colour. So I pay a lot of attention to the materials I use, and I use oil paints that are as pure as I can, partly because I'm uh, very concerned about my environment, but so I make sure I don't drop oil paint when I'm standing near a muscle bed. You know, I don't want to pollute the environment. Um, but also because... When I'm painting outside, if it's below about six degrees, something like Windsor and Newton goes solid because it's got so many fillers in it. So I've got to use paint that's made a bit better, more expensive, more oil, more pigment. And that's, that affects the painting, that affects the colors you can have, you know, it affects how it mixes, the feel of it, and so, on a good day, the paint is just delicious. It's just lovely. And on a bad day, when I'm, I'm tired or whatever, it's claggy. So. I, um, I think that's great to listen to. Is that, and it feels very embodied, just like the knowledge of your paints and your materials. And you know how it feels quite directly on the canvas, whether it's harder or softer. 
and that's just like an exciting um technical like relationship you have with materials which is almost like a dancer who knows their body and movement wow thank you for such a fascinating um exchange of ideas thank you all for coming thank you for the I know some people have had to leave um, a little bit earlier, so for those of you who have been here the whole day, um, for your participation and your attention and being here with us, with the work around here. Um, that's, I, I, I mean, the exhibition is finishing tomorrow, um, but I'm hoping, and Jen and I have always wanted this to be with a longer life, so a lot of this is going to go online. Um, We've also got a catalogue um, that kind of lets things live a little bit longer. And the idea is to carry on the conversation, carry on the thinking, um, that this may be the beginning of conversations amongst yourselves. So you may have met people. And one of the things that's a shame, we didn't have Ellen Mora de Wachter, who was going to be part of the panel, um, who has written Fe a Feiden book about co-art and, and people working collaboratively in their art practice. I sometimes think that painters are kind of slightly despotic alone in there making their own decisions. Um, and so it's really wonderful to bring painting to a collective and collaborative meaning-making session. I, th I think I've said just about everything I wanted to say. Just I'm just absolutely thrilled with, with the, the, the superb quality of input that's come from everyone. I'm so, so grateful that everyone's been so open and sharing. And I'm just thank you everybody so so very very much and a safe journey home fill in your um, forms your feedback forms and let's but let's keep in touch like Alina says we'll keep the Facebook uh, going but if we've got your emails we'll start sending stuff out we've got ideas about podcasts in the future um, the film will be available and um, thank you everybody round of applause for all our artists and everyone <laughs>And one last thank you for, we've had a team of support. We've got Jessica down there who's just worked her socks off with the teas and coffees and food. We've got a cameraman, Jonathan, over there, uh, Max, my husband over there on the sound desk, Hugh, and everybody who's uh, um, Joffrey over there hiding behind, and, and other people. We've lent us things. Max has lent us stuff for the sound system, and everyone who's put effort, time, money, Charmaine was mentioned earlier, and all our artists again. Thank you very much, everybody. And on behalf of us all, I want to ch thank Jen and Elena for doing a great job and uh, starting this, all, this whole thing off. So uh, thank you. And um, I'm sure it'll be the start of uh, some, something more. Everyone's popping now, so I'm going to pop. Thank you for the filmmakers and the poets and the writers and the models and everyone who isn't a painter who's kind of joined us as well. And I wish I knew that there was this microphone when I gave my talk because I love moving when I talk. But So thank you to this whole kind of coalescing of people with different types of working processes and practicing practices and coming together and exchanging ideas. Um, painting isn't just about being alone in your studio and, and making the work. It's also about coming together and actually talking about things and pushing things forwards in different directions.